In the film Groundhog Day, Rita, the producer character, was asked how she would respond if it was the end of the world. She replied, quote, I just want to know where to point the camera, end quote. Well, we don't believe we are actually at the end of the world. Knowing where to focus is certainly challenging. With so many big stories constantly breaking, we are beginning to do weekly retrospectives, considering what events might prove to be the most significant. This week, we begin with a particularly emotive clip from the Trump rally last weekend. 20 of 20 of the most dangerous cities in America are controlled by Democrats. Think of that, 20 of 20. And so is nearly every major city with a child poverty rate that's over 30%. They're controlled by Democrats. We can name every one of them. The murder rate in Baltimore and Detroit is higher than El Salvador, Guatemala, or even Afghanistan. How are they doing, the Democrats running those cities? Your whole country will be like that. In 2018 alone, our police arrested nearly 12,000 people for murder and manslaughter. 25,000 people for rape and nearly 1.5 million for assault, violent assault. The Democrats push against our police, will drive up crime and drive up costs at levels you'd never believe. Thousands of innocent lives will be lost. As president, I will always support the incredible men and women of law enforcement. A vote for Republicans is a vote for better schools, better jobs, safer families, and stronger communities for all Americans. I like this clip a lot. I think the rally in general, I think President Trump was a little rattled about the uh, the K-pop stunt, which hopefully is not repeated. And um, I think what the Democrats are missing, too, by the way, is the fact that the saw cuts both ways on that. And Joe Biden is already not really packing the arena, but I certainly uh, will fi- will sign up for any Joe Biden rallies that come across my radar and uh, catch a cold right after that coronavirus or something. So. Um, but he, I thought this President Trump really came into um, his, you know, his full. He was at he reached full sail at about an hour into the speech, and I thought this clip was particularly good. It, it, the reason it was I, I liked it is it compa- the comparison to these other countries um, in statistical terms. So here we have a fact based argument, um, which is a reflection of his own interior thought process because again president trump's intellect is greatly underrated and you know this one i just don't feel came from his speech writer it's it um it's it's a really good mixture of intuition and sensing which is common in the perceiving type it trump president trump's mbti type is estp and the estp will not reach conclusions but paint a picture and as a perceiving type, they'll take you into a scene and make connections very deftly. And that's one of the reasons when he is hitting on all cylinders, and he certainly does most of the time, rarely stumbles as you would, as, as uh, most normal people like myself. And I think even some of the politicians at a high level do the same thing as I think Bush too was notorious for this. But so, I, I hope we see this clip again. We'll we'll certainly be putting it on our channel. It can be found on our YouTube channel as an extract, and we'll be moving into the campaign season with this um, very powerful uh, analogy. And the other the other point is that uh, he's President Trump is right about the control of cities demographically. And if you look at the map, and we'll put that in the show. I I think the political map from 2016 shows the Clinton archipelago or the the surrounded nature of this situation if it did come down to um, you know conflict scenario which looks kind of like we are entering that we'd we'd the red states would have the out exterior lines of communication 
and transport pretty well locked up. So they're making a lot of noise, but it's contained. And again, they're angling for another electoral college loss here um, by, I think the left is really self-congratulating themselves for this little prank at the, at the rally and, and taking, um, putting way too much stock in these sort of short-term uh, victories that are really inconsequential. But what do you think, Don? Yeah, I agree with you completely, Ken. Um, I uh, noticed that the left, out of the gate, they were emphasizing the low turnout uh, at Trump's rally, and uh, there was this back and forth between the both political camps about what was the true cause of the inflated numbers and the decreased numbers, and um, and the person out there paying a limited amount of attention just gets, well, this was just some bickering that you can't prove it one way or the other, and, and both sides seem to be claiming at least a semblance of victory. Well, that's all to be expected. So I don't think that the the dim prank with the TikTok people really uh, is going to have the long-term effect that they wanted. Yeah, they boosted the morale of their their core, and uh, especially those that aren't even voters yet. So that kind of seems almost nonsensical. One of the things that I did to uh, to find an analysis of this is I I listened to a Tim cast from Tim Pool and his analysis of the. Uh, Trump's low rally turnout is pulling the Dems into another trap, and I th I think that puts it pretty concisely, and he goes into a fair amount of detail explaining why he believes it's a trap, and it has to do with his read, with Tim's read, on the uh, overall perception in society of the lack of safety. If you have to, if you dig, even scratch the surface with an analysis of what happened at the uh, Tulsa rally, you find that there were people b being uh, bullied and sh there were uh, Trump supporters that chose not to try to go through the gauntlet of the bullying people uh, in order to get into the rally. So uh, that was uh, pretty obviously there. And then the climate nationwide is that these Democrats or an Antifa people are causing riots and rallies and pulling down statues all over the country. And I have to wonder, and it's really almost seems obvious if you just take a one or two steps back, that Trump has allowed this to happen in order to be able to really mobilize the so-called silent majority. He's even tweeted out that the silent majority is stronger than ever. I think we we see the campaign strategy here, and it's really pretty obvious. It's let these guys have enough rope to hang themselves, and the the online viewing of the Tulsa rally was really uh, far surpassed any other previous rally, I believe, and uh, that's probably because people that didn't want to go to the rally just said, let's watch it online. We don't have to go through this. You know, it was a declared a... Um, an emergency in the in the Tulsa area, and uh, even though the mayor was supposedly a Trump supporter, there was some shenanigans being pulled by um, limiting uh, the the number of people that could get in, and the the, ch the people that were doing the checking of the security were pulled before they uh, they really should have been. All that kind of stuff that. Um, conservatives and Trump supporters kind of kick themselves and think, well, why did they allow this to happen? It made Trump look bad. Well, it's pretty obvious that this was a manipulation by the Democrats and that they are um, actually playing into Trump's hand of uh, proving themselves to be against law and order. And um, the kicker in Tim Pool's podcast was he used to be a Democrat supporter. He used to be a supporter of Andrew Wang, Yang, sorry, and he uh, he talked about his experience with the Second Amendment and you, he, that he used to be for more gun control restrictions, but no longer is after he actually went in and bought himself a firearm within the last week or two and uh, re and experienced the the checks that are already in place which as anybody who's done anything similar knows that there really is quite a bit of control already. 
and he talked about his conversation with the gun store owners. They were telling him how crowded it had been, and he said he's in a very blue area. So I think it was um, outside of uh, Philadelphia or, or Pittsburgh, I can't remember which, and um, it, but he said it's very blue, but the, the gun store owners were saying, yeah, people are really, they're selling a lot of guns. Well, people are concerned about the unrest, and uh, and you got to believe that there's not going to be people that have recently purchased firearms. They're going to be voting for Joe Biden. It just doesn't happen. But they're not going to talk about it to the pollsters or maybe or online. They're going to keep this this stuff to themselves because they don't want to make themselves a target. And it's this environment that uh, Tim Pool created in his uh, uh, analyzed in his video that really um, kind of put it all in a nutshell for me, helping me to see that this is an environment being created in which the supporters of the so-called silent majority are going to come out in droves because this is just going to do nothing but ramp up this um, contention between the lawlessness and the rule of law people is is going to keep amping up and it's not going to go away uh, so anyway i thought he had a really an interesting analysis especially from the standpoint of a former democrat recently purchasing a firearm and realizing how deep the support is in his very blue area. I guess that puts the ball in my court for my clip of the week, which came out just this morning. And today is Thursday as we record this. This morning there was a new Project Veritas video and the clip that I'm going to play has to do with a comment from an HR executive at Facebook as recorded by the undercover Project Veritas reporter. And what she says is that it's not a problem for Facebook or any, virtually any company to fire a white man because nobody has the white man's back. And as the clip will show, she said that attorneys would laugh a white man out of the office. We've heard this kind of anti-white bias in big tech before. Last year, one of our undercover journalists spoke with Leslie Brown, a former HR contractor for Google who now works as an HR executive for Facebook in San Francisco. She laughed about the anti-white male bias that exists inside big tech. All stories, but I mean, they were able to fire him without having to worry about discrimination. Due diligence, but, right, right. No, okay, a, I, yes, because no, well, no, it's a James white man. Yeah, 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 white man, so no problem. You, you can't do it that easily if, if there are other issues. Oh, it's, it's easier when they're White men. Okay. Yeah, no protected class. No one's, yeah, no one's, no one's, yeah. No one has the white men's back anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying because he's a white male, uh, there was, there's more that leverage. That if he chose to sue the company, that uh, uh, most attorneys would just laugh. If he... Wait, wait, white, white privilege. What, what about white <laughs> privilege? Liberal privilege. Oh, privilege. this is, uh, it's. I dare I use the term reverse racism, um, but that's what's going on here. And the whole story has to do with um, just the, the political atmosphere at Facebook that makes it virtually impossible for a white man, and particularly a white man who happens to be conservative, to work uh, for Facebook. And this was a, a this the company, this gentleman, the whistleblower worked for was a contractor with Facebook, um, but you know, same same issues, evidently. So this this is my this is my contribution. What I what I feel is significant this week, both the fact that it's true, and the fact that Project Veritas is exposing it. So thank you, Project Veritas. 
United States of America, not united at all, really. We um, we came from Europe, most of us originally, and uh, it was a probably, uh, in, I hate to go to geology and, and geography, but it was really the, the last ice age receded and all of a sudden we've got all this sort of new land that hadn't really been been settled as much. I mean, some of the Southern, uh, the Mayan civilization and some of the, those areas were, were moving along, but um, the sudden influx of, uh, of European settlers and I think their inability to till and manage in the Southern climates influenced the slave trade and, and, you know, a horrible system. I think everybody's in agreement in hindsight, certainly. And there was also a thing called Irish slavery that occurred as well, indentured servitude. This, the uh, African-American slavery was a step even worse. It was, um, you know, it was basically just uh, involuntary servitude, uh, which is really just imprisonment when you think about it and, and, and worse. But so we're kind of coming out of that phase and it's, it's a really long, tiresome process of humans relating to each other uh, on a personal level. And it takes time. It takes, it's not human time, it's God's time. And God's time moves in, in centuries, not in in minutes or hours. So the problem with this whole thing, I think, is traces back to Dunbar's, what, what's known as Dunbar's number. A human being can only know about 150 people personally, where you relate to them as a human being, where you have interchangeable ethical respect for the person, and that can definitely cross racial lines. I think we've everybody has had that experience, and um, there are very few left of what you would call real hardcore racists. Uh, they're they're probably still out there, but they're vastly overwhelmed by the, uh, the you know the sort of slow process of assimilation that's occurring. So the problem with affirmative action is is really either for political gain, which I th I think is probably the motive, or a well intentioned ignorance of Dunbar's number. They'll treat other people outside their their circle of 150 like objects, and they can either treat them in a positive vector, such as an affirmative action, or prejudicial. So the term white, whenever you preface a sentence with a racial slur, which it really is, no, there is no such thing as a white person. I, I know what they're saying, but again, they're, they're taking Dunbar's number and they're going over the 150 limit and making a value judgment about a group of people because they can't relate to it. Uh, it's impossible. The human brain can't do it. And I think that's the quandary we're in. So now I don't know whether the CIA knows this or not, but I think there there is the thought crafters in DC know that there's some problems that will never be solved, but they can you know, they can start a movement to ban oxygen from the atmosphere if they can get people to believe that oxygen is bad. And they know it's an insolvable problem, but it can be used as a vector of political anchoring so that later you can you can uh, trot out a polemic to bifurcate the electorate and uh, propel your party to power. So I think the Nazis did this with their anti-Semitic movement and um, it can energize people on the, the visceral or limbic system level where you, you can rewire their logic. And I think that's kind of what's happening here. Yeah, I agree, Ken. And uh, it, this has been going on in America for a while. And um, one of the things I think about is the famous quote from LBJ that had to do with the, the great society and how he was going to have the blacks and he didn't use blacks, he used a different word, which we're not gonna say here, and that he'd have them voting Democrat for the next 200 years. Well, it's all, all about the new plantation and getting the people to believe that you have their best interest in mind when you are actually enslaving them. And that's what politicians have done forever. That's the the role that the politician plays is to, to um, pose as the servant and actually become the master and the famous Charles de Gaulle quote. So that that's the takes the form of uh, these charges of racism in America and that's not to say there haven't been very real problems with racism but as society grows and interconnects we begin to value each other as humans in very natural ways. We're less segmented than we used to be and uh, just the whole idea of that, that America is, um, 
is profoundly racist. Is it systemically racist is the word that's being bandied around today? It's, um, it's blatantly false on the face of it because if you actually let the, the um, social justice warrior people define racism, they will actually say, well, that's a construct in your own mind. And then uh, if it is something that happens in your own psychology, which they claim, then how is it possible for that to be systemic? Well, it isn't. This is, this is a non sequitur. You can't get there from here. The whole thing is, is a, um, a faulty logic that doesn't stand up. And yeah, it's a control mechanism, just as Ken was saying, it's a, a way for the power brokers to divide and conquer. That's really all it is. And again, it uh, doesn't mean that there aren't real problems, but they're, they're dealt with on a human level, um, according to the principles that Martin Luther King said, let's judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And that's where uh, America was going until recently. And uh, it's really just come back as an issue because that's what the media and the power brokers want to have happen. And um, the, the whole um, thing of people being censored for their political views and, and their uh, along racial lines as a facade really has come into the forefront recently because of problems in the, um, the alternative media, which got Trump elected. It was because of the success in being able to manage new, new media that President Trump was elected to office. And these power brokers that are now hold these key positions in technology that enable the new form of communication, they don't want that to happen again. So as the article there, or the, the event, the Project Veritas expose that Cindy pointed out earlier goes to show this is becoming front and center in our really uh, attempt to return power back to the people in America as many of us believed it had already happened, but we're having to retake that ground. And it's, um, it's kind of a sobering thought to realize that there, there is a very entrenched power structure that doesn't want to let go. Um, one of the events that happened this week was that Carpe Donctum, who's the famous meme creator, creates some of the most viral memes, memes ever, was banned from Twitter. Uh, not a Facebook issue, but uh, definitely the new media, Twitter, he no longer allowed to be there because he had created a very, very um, clever video highlighting the uh, a supposedly racist baby. And of course, that wasn't what it was all about at all. And he was um, totally poking fun of this mindset, but he got outed for fake news. The, the problem is, is that the algorithms that are used by the big tech new media uh, to try to control people, they can't recognize sarcasm. And that is a big problem for them. And when somebody as creative and talented as Carpe Donctum comes along, well, they have no choice but to get rid of them. But I'm happy to say that you can find them on Parler, and there's been a huge um, movement of people that are on Twitter uh, that are politically active and supporters of President Trump. They're uh, now active on Parler. So uh, we created a, an account for PolyPsych Podcast there, and you can find us there. And I think that it's not going to replace Twitter, but it's going to be a means by which the truth will be able to get out because they won't be able to stop the, the spread of truth among the core of the MAGA movement, which is was really what's happened there. And yeah, there'll probably be some leftists that'll come in there, but it's a pretty even-handed platform. And I think basically logic and truth are going to be able to prevail because the users uh, can control their own environment rather than have the overlords tell them what they want to see. So, so far I like it. To the curious, the seekers, 
and the experts, we thank you for joining us for this retrospective of this week's news, interesting videos. If you have enjoyed this video, we ask that you please click like, subscribe to us on YouTube, subscribe to us on BitChute, follow us on Twitter, and if you have a moment, please visit our website. And we will exit with this last video, which we think will be helpful in moving into the weekend. Enjoy. And once again, thanks for joining us. Until next time, take care. Good morning, everyone. Schumer, Pelosi. Schumer and Pelosi. Schumer, Pelosi. Schumer and Pelosi. White Savior. They are the ones, white liberals, who promise to take good care of blacks. Schumer, Pelosi. Schumer and Pelosi. Schumer, Pelosi. Schumer and Pelosi. White Savior. They are the ones. White liberals who promise to take good care of blacks. I Orange man, but Orange man, but Orange man, but Orange man, but Trump is bad. We are the ones, white liberals, who promise to take good care of blacks.